Here are the top five mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery and how to avoid them. This show is brought to you by PRN Pharmacal. When you're choosing sutures, choose the right suture for the right surgery. Smart selections, quality choices, the right decision. PRN Pharmacal. Hi, I'm Dr. Courtney, and today I wanna to talk about the top five mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. Truthfully, I don't really like talking about mistakes, but they do happen, even to the best of us. But the only thing we can do is learn from them as they don't have to happen to you in order for you to necessarily learn from them. As the saying goes, smart people learn from their own mistakes, wise people learn from the mistakes of others. For me, veterinary medicine has been an incredible profession. My journey toward veterinary surgery took me to some amazing places. I spent time in a variety of disciplines, including radiology, internal medicine, equine sports medicine. I even spent time doing research and I thought for the longest time that veterinary radiology was my passion until I did several rotations in veterinary surgery, and then I was hooked. But, but, but veterinary surgery isn't a single destination. There's so many different levels to veterinary surgery that can be explored, including working as a small animal surgeon, a large animal surgeon, exotic animal medicine, in emergency medicine, research, academia, and of course, you can do veterinary surgery in a variety of other settings. Even if your main focus isn't veterinary surgery and you look at it more as a passive interest, I still think about that what we talk about today is great for any professional development. And listen, veterinary surgery can be incredibly satisfying for some of us. Some of us were blessed enough to have small hands, nimble fingers, a courageous spirit, and the ability to be on our feet for long hours nonstop, but it takes more than that to be successful at surgery. Judicious selection of diagnostics, great case management, knowledge of anatomy and physiology, attention to detail, appropriate decision making. They're just some of the important skills needed for surgery. And even if you don't like surgery, or even if you don't do surgery, you can still apply these principles to be better at what you do. And we're all dedicated and we work long hours, but one trait that's important to have as a surgeon is the ability to learn from mistakes or avoid them altogether. No one is immunized against making errors. So based on audience demand, in this session, we're gonna talk about a few tips and tricks that will be better for our patients. That's always the primary focus. It may improve your surgical outcomes and hopefully it'll make surgery more enjoyable. Some of what we'll be talking about today are truly mistakes, others are good practices, and others are just personal tips and tricks that work for me. But because the word mistakes is in the title, let's briefly talk about them. We all wanna learn from them. There are only a few published studies looking at mistakes within veterinary medicine, and even fewer looking at veterinary surgical errors. And there's no error reporting systems that I'm aware of in veterinary medicine, but providing that information to a central database could lead to improved patient safety. So I hope that is the next frontier. So today we're gonna to talk about the top five mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. But not only do I wanna describe and analyze these tips and tricks, but I want to frame them according to Halstead's principles. To be sure, there's plenty of people that have given us great foundational elements to veterinary surgery and just surgery in general. But in this discussion, we're going to use the principles that Halstead gave us to give us scope and perspective as to their importance. But first, who was Halstead? Halstead was an American surgeon and one of the founding surgeons at John Hopkins University. His list of accomplishments and claims to surgical fame are literally too long to mention. But just some of the highlights include advancing new methods to control bleeding. He adhered to a principle of absolute cleanliness and careful reconstruction. Halstead's knowledge of surgical anatomy and dissection was superb and his technique was precise. Halstead revolutionized surgery by insisting on skill and technique rather than brute strength. He was described as being excruciatingly slow and he was a meticulous surgeon known for his gentle tissue handling of tissue. His approach was considered revolutionary at the time because rough tissue handling and lack of asepsis were pretty much the norm at that time. Let's quickly mention just a few of Halstead's accomplishments. In 1882, he performed one of the first cholecystectomies in the US. It was done on his mother, reportedly on the kitchen table at 2 a.m., allegedly. 
He performed one of the first blood transfusions in the US. He gave blood to his sister who had just delivered a baby. He performed the first radical mastectomy for breast cancer, removing the breast, pectoral muscles, and all adjacent lymph nodes. He became chief of surgery at John Hopkins Hospital in 1889 and professor of surgery in 1892. At Johns Hopkins, Halstead started the first formal surgical residency training program in the US. Not only did he emphasize hygiene and wound healing, but he also introduced what in many ways is similar to the current iteration of the surgical glove, made of thin rubber. Thanks to him, surgeons worldwide began wearing gloves during operations. The idea that gloves might also help in germ control actually didn't occur to any of them for years, which Halstead commented on somewhat puzzled long after surgeons started using them. He contributed to significant advances in thyroid, biliary, hernia, intestinal, arterial aneurysm surgeries, in addition to pioneering a bunch of other procedures. Dr. Halstead's innovations included improving analgesia during surgery, and Halstead discovered that an injection into a major nerve trunk could numb a whole limb or block the spinal cord. Unfortunately, he suffered from that discovery. He ended up fighting a lifelong battle against drug addiction, including cocaine and morphine, after a bout of self-experimentation with its newfound anesthetic properties. Not only did he spearhead the practice of putting temperature checks in medical records, he also jump-started the see one, do one, teach one axiom that undergirded his entire teaching style. So now that we have a, just a tiny peek into why Dr. Halstead was so great, what are some of the surgical principles that are attributed to his work? Well, let's talk about them right now. Gentle tissue handling, meticulous hemorrhage control, strict aseptic technique, preserving blood supply to the tissues, eliminating dead space, opposing tissues accurately, and opposing tissues with minimal tension. So as you can see, these principles are pretty comprehensive. Halstead was a huge proponent of aseptic technique. And this leads us to our first mistake you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. Mistake number one, operating in a dirty operating room. Listen, we are starting with the least glorious and arguably the least sexy tenant of veterinary surgery. However, it's vitally important to perform surgery in a clean OR to ensure asepsis and the subsequent success of your surgeries. Adhering to aseptic technique is essential to decrease the potential for surgical site infection, which ultimately saves lives. So just how do you ensure that you and your OR remain clean while you do surgery? Let's break down the surgical preparation into three phases. Preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. Preoperatively, to be sure there are a host of patient factors that could lead to poor healing and horrible surgical site infections, including obesity, poor nutrition, recent surgery, skin infection, old age, radiation, just to name a few. But to minimize environmental factors, it's best to keep a safe and salubrious operating theater in which all sources of pollution and any microenvironmental alterations are kept strictly under control. And this can be achieved through careful planning, maintenance, periodic checks, as well as proper ongoing training for staff. To start, Clip hair outside of the surgery room. Two, use different blades for dirty or infected wounds than you would for a sterile surgery. Three, clean and disinfect. Ensure that you're removing all organic debris, using the proper disinfectant, adhering to contact times and drying times. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the physical removal of microorganisms and soil by scrubbing is more important than the actual antimicrobial being used. Intraoperatively, Reducing noise in the operating room can not only decrease distraction, but it can help decrease surgical site infections. Although we can't be sure why, it could be related to the inability to concentrate in a stressful environment, or maybe there's another cause. Five, it's okay to play music at a soft level because apparently cognitive stimulus causes distraction while sensory distraction doesn't necessarily distract. Essentially, stimuli requires that requires thinking and a response could really harm your surgical outcomes. Try limiting staff from coming to the operating room other than during surgical time. A study looking at workflow turnover and how it affects surgical site infections found that it's important to keep traffic to a minimum. They also found that males were at an increased risk of surgical site infections, which can be interpreted in a variety of ways. 
Another prospective study evaluated what factors contributed to a wound having an infected outcome, and what did they find? The duration of surgery, the number of people in the operating room, a dirty surgical site, and antimicrobial prophylaxis had a protective effect. So what were the conclusions from that study? Keep traffic to a minimum, wear a cap and mask at all times, keep a clean OR, and make sure you're diligent about the use of perioperative antibiotics. So the keys to both preoperative and intraoperative preparation are going to be aseptic preparation, the diligent use of antiseptics, and wearing a cap and mask at all times. But how about postoperatively? I'd say one, have a team. A clean OR is a life-saving procedure. Having the most experienced person and or team member on your surgical team to train the others on proper cleaning is a great idea. Number two, new materials. If possible, new materials should be used for each patient, including towels, blankets, new drapes, warming blankets, and trash. Make sure to take out the trash and replace the trash bag. Now, this may sound clear and obvious to some, but there are those who, in an attempt to minimize environmental impact and exert some cost savings, may simply empty the trash while continuing to use the same bag. Clean the OR free of organic material, blood, pus, eliminations that, that include feces, again, using the proper disinfectant. Delicate cleaning should also include probes used for anesthetic monitoring. Forgotten surfaces, the surfaces of the operating room should be cleaned daily to re reduce microbial burden. And this includes horizontal surfaces, which are forgotten, desks, shelves, the surgery table, um, and, and also vacuuming and mopping. You gotta do that to the floor, the surgery lights. And don't forget the wheels, on the walls, the cabinets, the keyboard, the cautery, IV pumps and poles, anesthetic machines, anesthesia hoses and bags, and countertops, the windows, blinds, and doors. And make sure you check the dates of sterilization and the filters. Dedication. Having a dedicated team who has dedicated equipment, including dedicated mops, brooms, and, and, and floor sweepers that only you are being used for those activities is vital. And most importantly, protect your staff. Always wear gloves and follow the appropriate safety precautions because using some of these materials can be caustic. Okay, let's move to number two on the list of mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. Leaving a sponge. Listen, sponges. They help us visualize tissues and structures. They help us with hemostasis. They help us retract tissue, and they can be incredibly useful in dissection and other surgical procedures. But when they're coated in blood, they can be incognito. They blend in with their surroundings and they can be tucked under tissue or instruments and just out of sight. The dreaded situation of leaving a surgical sponge behind, meaning it's forgotten in a patient's body, is something anyone who does surgery wants to avoid. Despite that, it's still a situation that has befallen even the best surgeons. So what can happen when a surgical sponge is left behind? When an incision is sewn up with a surgical sponge still inside, it can result in serious infections and other potentially debilitating complications, which in the most severe cases can even lead to death. Focusing on the patient first, potential complications of leaving a sponge behind include formation of a Gossi piboma. First, there's an exudative reaction, which leads to the formation of an abscess. But then there's also a fibrotic reaction, which leads to adhesions and mass-like structures in the abdomen. Retained surgical sponges can also be carcinogenic, with at least one report of an intra-abdominal fibrosarcoma forming secondary to a retained surgical sponge. Retained surgical sponges can also lead to sponge migration, intestinal obstruction, malabsorption, or even hemorrhage. Fistulation, may occur between the mass and the bowel lumen or other organs such as the urinary bladder, and such transmigration may leave a persisting fistula. Retained surgical sponges can also cause adhesions to the urinary tract and the intestinal tract, including the bladder, then the small intestines, jejunum, colon, arteries, kidney, ureter, just a mess. So here are some risk factors for leaving a surgical sponge behind. Some have been extrapolated from human medicine, others come from very few veterinary studies on this issue, and some are just based on my personal experience. So one, emergency surgery. When there's profuse hemorrhage during emergency surgery, there's a tendency to use many sponges and pads, and this increases the likelihood of some being forgotten if the surgeon and the scrub nurses are not vigilant. Two, fatigue. 
late night surgeries, more surgeries than you're comfortable with, that could lead to leaving a sponge behind. Unexpected complications. You may have an anesthetic complication that requires you to hurry and finish the surgery, potentially leaving a sponge behind. Unplanned procedures, things you weren't thinking about. Distractions in the operating room. A break in normal sequence of procedure. Patients with a large body mass, patients who are obese. And poor communication between the technical staff and the surgeon. And if there are staff changes that happen in the OR. So the way to minimize that this will ever happen to you are keep sponges a certain distance from the incision. Communicate with team members. Ask your team members to help you remember. I placed a sponge next to the left lateral lobe of the liver and please put it on a post-it note so it can help us remember. Number three, pre-count sponges and verify that count with your scrub nurse. If you're not scrubbing in with an assistant for that particular procedure, then perform a gauze count twice just to double check yourself. Number four, keep sponges in a centralized location. Number five, use laparotomy sponges if possible and keep radiopaque sponges to a minimum. Six, make sure to do a post-op sponge count. Seven, radiographs are helpful, but if you're using a radio-opaque sponge, keep in mind that if you left one behind, you still have to go and bring your patient back to the operating room, which is never ideal. But hey, that's much better than leaving a sponge in the body without you knowing. Eight, swabs. They should only be used intra-abdominally if they're mounted on a stick, otherwise known as cotton tip applicators. Nine, newer technologies include electronic article surveillance systems, which use tagged surgical sponges that can be detected electronically. And this was where barcodes are applied to all sponges and they're detectable with a barcode scanner. However, these newer technologies are not yet in general use. And number 10, there's likely more solutions. I encourage you to share your solutions and add to this discussion because knowledge is power and that information will only help our patients. So I say crowdsource ideas. So here are just a few examples of what I'm referring to. A preoperative sponge count is performed by me and then double checked by a team member. The sponges are placed in a centralized location during the surgery. And before the abdomen is closed, another sponge count is performed. And now to number three on the list of mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. Oppose tissues accurately. Listen, I had a lot of fun with anatomy in vet school. In fact, I even had the pleasure of being an anatomy and physiology tutor. And yeah, it made me feel good at the time. But as soon as I stepped into that role, I realized there was so much more I needed to learn. And the learning hasn't stopped since. I still think it's important and really fun to learn and refresh your anatomy knowledge. And that's why the third mistake you want to avoid is not knowing your anatomy. Proficiency in surgical care is complex. You have to have a good handle on surgical instrumentation, procedural steps, but also having a solid foundation in anatomy and physiology for organ systems, that's essential. But how exactly do we learn? Like anything else, there are plenty of theories. However, scientists have boiled it down into four main processes. Conceptualization, experimentation, experience, and reflection. For me, these four processes play out before a surgery by reading, which is visualization and conceptualization. Experience and experimentation takes place during the surgery itself. And I don't mean experiment like if you're experimenting in a research setting, but if something's not working in surgery, you try something else, which is a form of experimentation. And then right after the procedure, I would go home and read about the surgery all over again, which is a way for me to reflect. One example I want to highlight regarding how important it is to know your anatomy is intestinal surgery. Let's for a second consider an enterotomy. As we all know, an enterotomy is the most commonly performed surgical procedure of the intestine. And we do them so routinely for foreign bodies that sometimes we forget about closing it, but we focus more on what strange object we're going to pull out of the intestine. But we need to focus on how to close it. Besides removing foreign material or repairing trauma or full thickness ulcerations or perforations, even intestinal biopsies. That's fresh on my mind because literally yesterday I had the pleasure of performing full thickness biopsies on a cat who is suspected of having IBD. So let's talk about intestinal closure. The small intestine is structurally composed of four layers, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. But when it comes to intestinal closure, it's really all about this almighty submucosa. The submucosa is recognized to be one of the strongest parts in the intestinal wall, and therefore it's absolutely critical to include this in your intestinal closures. 
Incorporating the submucosa in your closures gives you an excellent chance of success and failure to do so could lead to disastrous consequences. Effective closure is critical to avoid complications like leakage and dehiscence, which can lead to septic peritonitis. Compromised healing can force you to reoperate, which increases morbidity, cost, hospitalization, and ultimately increases mortality. So let's try to our best to avoid these complications, but how do we do it? Well, with the modified Gamby. Okay, so we're just going to do a modified Gamby here, where you, you place two, Rob is, Rob is going ahead and holding for me, we've got two hemostats tagging on either side, and then we're just going to come in from this side, okay, grab submucosa, come out of the mucosa, come into the mucosa, and then grab submucosa again, from here, and then go ahead and place your forceps between the loop to get it to cinch down nice and tight. So what we're doing essentially is a variation of a modified continuous Gamby suture. We're going to come in again through the serosa here in the submucosa, pull back, come through the mucosa, and then find the mucosa on the other side, come through the submucosa into the serosa. Again, come through, regrasp your needle, go ahead. Find your loop with your forceps and cinch it down nice and tight. Okay? And that is the a variation of the continuous modified Gamby suture. Okay. The modified Gamby suture starts by entering the serosa on one side of the enterotomy, then enters the mucosal surface. That bite continues by entering the mucosa on the same side of the incision and exits out the submucosa. Then the suture is carried across the incision into the opposite wound edge and enters the opposing submucosal layer. The needle exits down into the gut lumen and enters back through the mucosa and exits through the wall on the serosal surface. The suture is then tied across the incision. And what I like the most is that the modified Gamby had a higher mean peak initial leak pressure than all other closure types and had a higher maximum leak pressure when compared to simple continuous and staple closures. This suture pattern takes longer than some of the other options, but like anything else, with practice, you can get really good at it. And I'm not aware of any studies on this, but I know a few surgeons that do a continuous modified Gamby for the best of both worlds, both speed and security. And on to number four on the list of mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. Don't forget about your subcutaneous pattern. Okay, it's not actually a mistake, but a good subcutaneous pattern can often be overlooked, and a good sub-Q layer will get you out of trouble almost any day of the week. And what do I mean by get you out of trouble? I mean a good subcutaneous layer will help you decrease dead space and therefore seroma formation. It will help you reduce tension along the skin edge and can also help with hemostasis. I prefer to use a rapidly absorbable suture material like on a tapered needle. For me, a rapidly absorbable suture in these situations is ideal. Because the suture is close to the skin, I don't want foreign material extruding from the skin or even close to the skin for a prolonged period of time. Essentially, it reduces the duration that foreign material, this case suture, persisting within the wound and it will be quickly absorbed. I prefer to use a monofilament suture because it's less reactive than a multifilament. And for cats and dogs, I prefer to use a 3-0 or 4-0 size suture material. If there's some tension on the wound edges, I might select a slightly larger suture than normal and I place finer sutures in the skin. Monofilament suture is also preferred in the subcutaneous layer because multifilament suture may entrap bacteria and potentiate infection. And my personal preference is a continuous pattern, mainly for reasons that you bury less suture material, which creates less of a tissue reaction, and it's slightly faster. Of course, the risk is that it could result in a complete dehiscence of the entire suture layer. But with a subcutaneous layer, you can place one or two layers. If you happen to be suturing a pet that has a little bit more insulation, meaning fat, then you can certainly suit for the deepest layer of fat first, then the second layer can include the fat just closest to the dermis. Both of these layers help to relieve tension right next to the skin. And fat, it doesn't have the best holding power and you might just pull through. So the recommendation in that situation, just take bigger bites.
One other tip I always talk about when placing subcutaneous layer is to remember to tack. Tacking or a quilting suture pattern was described in 1998 in humans as a way to prevent seroma formation. And as we just talked about, subcutaneous tissues are typically closed in a simple continuous pattern. But when it comes to a quilting pattern on the abdomen, pass the suture through the rectus sheath on every second or third bite. By doing that, you're anchoring the subcutaneous suture to the abdominal wall. And what's great about this technique is that it was not only shown to decrease seroma formation, but this pattern also decreased post-operative pain. And what's great about it is it didn't actually take any extra time. So take care to only include the rectus sheath as a holding layer of the abdominal wall when you're suturing, because inclusion of the muscle in the suture line leads to necrosis and failure of the sutures to hold. My personal preference is to reach deep to the skin rather than pulling up on the skin and tensioning it. Because when you tension the skin like that, it actually pulls the subcutaneous layer tighter against the dermis, making it a lot more difficult to find than reaching deep to the skin to find that subcutaneous layer. This results in less tissue handling and potentially less post-operative pain and swelling and erythema. Take bites between five millimeters to 10 millimeters from the skin edge. And when you're closing, you have a couple of choices. You can take bites perpendicular to the incision, which is a simple continuous pattern, or bites parallel to the incision, which technically would be a running horizontal mattress pattern. Continuous, simple, simple continuous. You wanna reach underneath the, reach, reach underneath the skin. Take a bite here. And then again, reach perpendicular, take your bite perpendicular to the skin like that, okay? If you wanna take your bites aligned with the skin as a horizontal mattress, then you reach underneath the skin here and take bites aligned with the incision. So then you come through and take another bite aligned with the incision. Yes. And that's together. Excellent. And then you just complete the rest of the incision with your subcutaneous. These bites will be about one centimeter wide and one centimeter apart. And when tying your initial knot, or if you're choosing to do a simple interrupted pattern, try to put ventral traction on the suture so that you're securing the knot and burying it deep in the subcutaneous layer. So when it comes to subcutaneous closures, don't be afraid to put multiple layers if you need to. Don't be afraid to run a continuous. Try to use a monofilament. And when you're closing tissues that aren't freely movable, don't forget to use a quilting continuous suture. And now number five on the list of mistakes you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery, suture selection. Although this doesn't fit neatly into Halstead's principles, selecting the right suture will likely help you with all of those principles we've already mentioned. I saved the best for last because this one is actually the most or the least challenging depending upon how you look at it. Because when it comes to suture selection, there are a few right answers. There's a bunch of them. Now to be sure, there's some wrong answers too, but fortunately most surgeons select the right one and they have really successful surgical outcomes. So before we jump into it, let's talk about what we should even consider when we're picking suture. Consider the length of time the suture will be required to help strengthen the tissue and hold it in place for healing. We also want to consider the risk of infection, the risk of the suture material will have on wound healing, the size of the suture material, the dimension of the wound and the strength of the suture required, underlying health issues, and any personal preferences you may have, just to name a few. So now that we've talked about some of the considerations, let's jump right into it. What do we use for skin? My preference, synthetic monofilament non-absorbable sutures are generally a good choice. They have good knot security and they have little to no capillarity, which is the ability for suture to wick and hold bacterial. Here is a traditional example of a cruciate suture pattern. And we're just gonna do a regular cruciate here, starting about a millimeter to two millimeters away from the skin edge and come through two millimeters away from the skin edge here. We grasp your needle, pull through, again, two millimeters, come through, grasp your needle, 
this stage and put your needle holders in the middle of the loop so you can judge the distance the suture is from. First throw, I like to do a surgeon's throw and then secure the suture to the top of the skin. The second loop is for your tension, right? And here, you want to pull up, up, and then the third throw locks it, okay? That is regular skin cruciate suture. Here is another example of one of my favorite suture patterns for skin, the inverse cruciate suture pattern. Just called the inverted cruciate, simply where you come at the skin at an angle, two millimeters away, take a bite here, take a bite there, and come across, take a bite here, two millimeters away, and cross your previous suture like that. And you pull, again, make two throws for a surgeon's knot, and lay the suture on top of the skin, and make a, a square knot, and then another square knot. And the reason why I like this suture is, less suture is buried underneath the skin, and uh, it's an inverted cruciate. What about the abdomen? Well, when you're closing the abdomen, the rectus sheath is your holding layer, and you definitely want it to be secure. For suture, you probably want to avoid using surgical gut as it is rapidly dissolved and unlikely to last sufficiently long. I prefer to use a mid-term or long-term absorbable suture for the linea. Keep in mind that the use of non-absorbable suture in a wound that is contaminated or infected could lead to fistula formation. Staples. Surgical staples, tissue adhesive, surgical tape are widely used methods to close surgical wounds or traumatic injuries. Surgical staples are faster to apply than some sutures and in some reports are associated with fewer wound infections, likely due to less skin manipulation. What about for tendons? Non-absorbable suture is most frequently selected and this is likely due to the poor blood supply and poor healing properties of tendons and ligaments. And therefore, the suture material selected for a tendon should be strong, non-absorbable, and minimally reactive. For hollow viscous, hollow viscous like the trachea, gastrointestinal tract, and bladder should all likely be sutured with an absorbable monofilament. Now the choice between which absorbable certainly varies depending upon the condition. And my personal preference is to use a 3-0 to 4-0 midterm absorbable suture. Intestine. Although a myriad of sutures have been successfully used for intestinal closures, my preference is to use a monofilament because it has less inflammation, less drag, and has better strength than some of the other options. Wounds. Even those of us who don't do a lot of surgery, we've been face to face with fresh wounds. Fresh wounds in some cases can be clean, debrided, and closed, but the use of suture really should be minimized in contaminated wounds. Monofilament sutures withstand contamination better than multifilament sutures, but certainly try to avoid slowly absorbing multifilament or non-absorbable sutures because they may potentiate infection. Also try to avoid using surgical gut because its absorption in an infected tissue is highly unpredictable. Needles. Manufacturers make so many different types of suture materials, needles, shapes and sizes, and there's so many options. Here are a few things to keep in mind when it comes to needles. Taper needles are typically used for hollow organs. Cutting or reverse cutting needles are most frequently used for the skin. Good questions that you want to ask yourself, and you could ask these out loud, I talk to myself in surgery all the time. What size, shape, and point of needle is needed? And does it come with the selected suture material and size? What size of needle will reach across both sides of the incision at the desired depth? How tough or fragile is the material being closed? Will it influence taper, taper cut, or reverse cutting needle? Reverse cutting needles are generally preferred for skin. And there it is. The top five mistakes that you can't afford to make in veterinary surgery. And hopefully we included some tips and tricks and some pearls of wisdom to help you avoid making those mistakes. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below so we can hear what you want to hear next. Don't forget, there's nothing stronger than the human-animal bond.